I need to try and remember SOS because I don't know what I'm beeping out to everybody. It's beep, beeping random. That's what it is. It's like beep, 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 beep. It's like that, I think. Ha ha, we're live. <laughs> beep, 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 boop, boop. That's my favorite. <laughs> when it goes boop, 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 boop. Three, two. This, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 637, recorded on Wednesday, September 20th, 2017. What color is your sky? Hey everyone, I am Dr. Kiki, and tonight on This Week in Science, we are going to fill your heads with a black planet, blue skies, and thoughts of being eaten alive. <laughs> but first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Humans, since the dawn of time... Wait, humans haven't been around since the dawn of time. Since the dawn of somewhat recent events, maybe. Science has been humanity's greatest accomplishment. There have been a few other accomplishments along the way, but really too few to mention, mostly having to do with figuring out what is and isn't edible in trial and error type things that largely went awry. Without science, we would know nothing reliable about the past. We would know precious little about the present, and the future would reliably include cycles of famine, war, and pestilence. We're still, dishes and laundry would all be done by hand. <gasps> and long distance communication would require a lot of walking. While humans continue to build upon the best thing they ever came up with, we continue to report on their progress in the hope that through better understanding of the greatest accomplishments of humans, we can understand where humanity has been and where it is headed. And while not all humanity seems headed in the same direction, you are certainly headed for a bright future as you have walked into another episode of this Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. What's happening? And a good science to you too, Justin Blair and everyone out there. Welcome once again to This Week in Science. Welcome back to the weekly science show that's full of discussion and science and fun, friendship, happiness. I don't know. This is, it's a good place to be and we're glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. You and you glad. We have an amazing show lined up for you tonight with all sorts of really interesting science news. I have stories about investigations into hot Jupiter exoplanets, plaques and tangles living together. Oh my. And the ignoblest research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of my favorites. Justin, what do you have? The end is pie. <laughs> and uh, Papua Nui history update. Uh, color of dinosaur eggs. Hmm? And oh. the right way to touch a woman. With permission, you mean? With permission. <laughs> well, that, there you go. Very well stated, Blair. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad I did it. I it's all over. It's over. It's over. A story. We don't, don't even need to do the story now. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's get into the show. No, Blair. Yes. 
I the, yeah, I just was skipping over it because it's full of nightmare juice and I'm terrified. <laughs> well, like, maybe we know, can just move on. No, it's almost Halloween. We're getting up to it now, and I'm just preparing a little bit. So I brought some cannibalistic spiders. I brought some killer frogs, and I brought um, some worms. Yep. Mm. Okay. It's all. Yeah. You, you guys, if you're if you're waiting for the Blair's Animal Corner segment of the show, it is going to provide you with your nightmare juice this week. Just Unless you kidding. like spiders and frogs and worms, then it'll just make you feel all warm and fuzzy. Nope, no, I don't. I don't know about this week and these. I do. I do like those things. Yeah. These these stories though. Mm. <laughs> but now let's get into the show. Our segment of the show that we do love so much. This week in What Has Science Done For Me Lately? Lately. Thanks for joining in, Justin. I do <laughs> love that. <laughs> All right. We have a wonderful letter from Maddie and Jen Sorrow. Hey, guys. First, we love your show, and we listen together on a weekly basis, and that's a good seg. You'll note I said we. We has changed a lot for my wife and I over the past year, and that's what science has done for us lately. You see, a little over a year ago, we were told by our doctors to talk to a rep reproductive endocrinologist. The short story is that it appeared there was no way we could have children naturally. My wife and I both have, uh, excuse me, my wife and I both have issues on our own that make having a child difficult. Combine these issues together, it just couldn't happen. But science to the rescue! Thanks to a whole slew of different scientific fields, we were able to bring our daughter home last month. Yay! Yeah, science gave us the work of Patrick Steptoe and Nobel winner Richard Edwards, who developed in vitro fertilization. It gave us our reproductive endocrinologist, whose specialization is hormones and was able to trick our bodies into working right long enough to put the parts together to make a baby. It gave us the geneticists who performed genetic screening for us to ensure that there were no genetic problems that could make an embryo incompatible with life. It gave us embryologists who could select the embryos that were most likely to survive the IVS, IVF process and make it to full term. It gave us the pharmaceutical scientists to develop the epidural to limit my wife's pain over 22 hours of labor and the anesthesiologists to administer it. It gave our daughter the vaccinations to prevent disease. It gave her vitamin K shots to prevent ble bleeding and eye drops to prevent blindness. There are hundreds more ways that science helped this whole thing happen, but this email has to end at some point. So really, what I am saying is, what has science done for me lately? Science gave my wife and I this little beautiful girl, Ada Marie. Oh, my wife and so I awesome. owe our family to science, and for that we are eternally grateful. <laughs> that's what science has done. That's what science has done for us lately. Thank you again for everything you guys do, and keep fighting the good fight to spread the light of science over the land. Maddie and Jen Sorrow. P.S. Ada Lovelace Marie Curie, because we're nerds like that. Yay! So That's science awesome. also gave her a science baby name. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely fantastic and brilliant, and what a what a heartwarming story. I love these these stories for so many reasons, but one of my favorites is that it proves that our listeners are not a fake number. <laughs> that it's actually these individual people with real lives that we can bring the science to every week. It makes me so excited to do this. So science for you is showing us we actually have yeah. more of an audience. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, they're just a number on a page. They're individuals that download our episode and listen to what we have. And have amazing, interesting lives. And yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's so cool. Yeah. Thank it, you for sharing your stories with us. It's fantastic. Yeah. Any story. This, uh, this one was an, a heart-lifting, heartwarming story. And we're so glad that you were able to successfully conceive. And your little girl is going to be one of the children of the future. Helping us survive the future. Helping us solve problems. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. And everyone out there, if you would like to send us your story of what science, or just a single word or a sentence about what science has done for you lately, 
you can send us a message on our Facebook page. Ooh, extra points if it's a haiku or a limerick. <laughs> All right, extra points, exactly. <laughs> Plus one. That's right. So Facebook page, facebook.com slash This Week in Science, or just go to Facebook and look for This Week in Science and send us a message because we want to hear from you. You know what it's time for now? The news. The news. But you know what we're going to talk about first in the news? What? <sighs> Some totally improbable science news. Uh -huh. Yes, the, the time of the year. I can't believe our, a year has already passed. Every year when this comes around again, I'm like, already? It's time Wait, again. What's coming around again? What's coming around again? <laughs> the Ig Nobel right. I don't even know. Prizes. Oh, the Ig Nobels. I love these. These are fun. Yeah, they also mean that the Nobels are coming up soon, but yeah. not quite yet. Luckily, we don't have to report on everything in one show. But the 2017 Ig Nobel Prizes were awarded on Thursday, September 14th, 2017. This was the 27th first annual Ig Nobel Prize <laughs> ceremony. Took place at Harvard's Sanders Theater. And let me let, let me know. Let me tell you. Let me let you know who won some improbable awards for physics. An award went to France, Singapore, and the USA for a question using probe dynamic, uh, fluid dynamics to probe this question. Can a cat be both a solid and a liquid? Oh. <laughs> Yes. yes, and if yes. you are interested in finding this study, the reference is the reference title is "On the Rheology of Cats." Oh my God! What they find? They are liquids, right? <laughs> yes. Is this so, some sort of Heisenbergian cat? Like, or did they just <laughs> are these? Did they just find a bunch of very literal scientists who took? <laughs> the uncertainty principle was like, well, in that case, I suppose a cat could be either a gas or a solid or a liquid. It's very possible. So it could be a fluid. Can fluid. a cat be a fluid? You know, the idea of, and this is a, this is, I'll read from the abstract. We have many awards to, to get through, but I will, this is a very interesting question. From the French author, in this letter, I highlight some of the most recent developments around the rheology of Felis catus, with potential applications for other species of the Philidae family in the linear rheology regime. Many factors can enter the determination of the characteristic time of cats, from surface effects to yield stress. In the non-linear rheology regime, flow instabilities can emerge. Nonetheless, the flow rate, which is the usual dimensional control parameter, can be hard to compute because cats are active rheological materials. I, I, you know, I often feel like this urge to try to defend in some way, like what the researchers were going for and how it could be interpreted oddly from outside. But I don't know, nothing. I got nothing. Oh I got nothing. Goodness. Yeah, I love the 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 figure for figure one. Is all these cats in sinks and bowls and glasses yeah. that stuff themselves in. And so figure one's description is A, a cat appears as a solid material with a consistent shape, rotating, rotating and bouncing like silly putty on a short, on short time scales. <laughs> B, at longer time scales, a cat flows and fills an empty wine glass. In both cases, even if the samples are different, we can estimate the relaxation time to be in the range of tau equals one second to one minute. Oh For my God. older cats, we can also introduce a characteristic time of expansion and distinguish between lipid, C, and gaseous, D, feline states. Oh my God. <laughs> that is fantastic. <laughs> I just want to read this whole study now. <laughs> it's just—it's definitely one of those classic things where 
scientists see a thing and one person just goes that cat's in that sink that's hilarious it looks like it was poured in there and the scientist like a fluid well um let's talk about the physics behind that (laughs) exactly (laughs) yes so many examples of cats and their fluid motions but are they actually fluids yes no (sighs) no not actually fluids Moving on from physics, which I think uh, just off the top, that wins my vote as best of show. <laughs> I, I feel like they were they were going for the Ignoble Award, though. I feel like they yeah. were really they like, were hey, let's win this thing. <laughs> we're, not going, we're not winning it with any of the other research, but I got a winner. I know yeah. one award we can get. Yeah. The Peace Prize goes to Switzerland, Canada, the Netherlands, and the USA for demonstrating that regular playing of a didgeridoo is an, is an effective treatment for obstructive sleep apnea and storing. Oh, that's not ignoble. That makes total sense. <laughs> Actually, yeah. <laughs> didgeridoo didgeridoo puts you to sleep? That's what they're trying to say? No, that if you no, learn no, to uh, play a didgeridoo, is, yeah. Oh. Right. So sleep apnea is a sort of congestive uh, right. sleepy time disease where you're not getting enough oxygen. So... Having an activity where that opens up the uh, right. the pipes to, uh, and your practices a lot of deeper breathing. Or, well, or and don't a lot of didgeridoo breathing. players do circular breathing? Isn't that part of the deal? Yeah. 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 So that would definitely help. I don't think yeah. that's ignoble. I think that now that's a good study. I'm actually. Well, I love that I they might, gave him they gave I them the peace prize the because peace prize. Of, <laughs> because it stops oh. the snoring. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so for okay. many married couples around the world, <laughs> if you have a partner so, so who has a snoring night, but, problem, but yeah, the okay. neighbors during the day. <laughs> wow, right, 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 right. Wow, wow. All right, economics. There you go. You're like a real didgeridoo there. Uh, Economics Prize, Australia and USA, for their experiments to see how contact with a live crocodile affects a person's willingness to gamble. Huh. Mm (laughs) Okay. The title of the study is Never Smile at a Crocodile. Betting on electronic gaming machines is intensified by reptile-induced arousal. Reptile induced arousal, you say? I do say. Yeah, so in this abstract, they say that they had 62 females and 41 females randomly assigned to play a laptop simulated electronic gaming machine either prior to entry to or after having held a one meter long saltwater crocodile. Gambling behavior included bet size, speed of betting, final pants, and trials played on this electronic gambling machine was investigated with respect to participants assigned arousal condition, problem gambling status, and effective state. At-risk gamblers with few self-reported negative emotions placed higher average bets at the electronic gambling machine after having held the crocodile when compared to the control. Hmm. In contrast, at-risk gamblers with many self-reported negative emotions placed lower average bets at the gaming machines after he- holding the crocodile. So this so made suggests them feel that like very strong and if you're an capable. if you're an at-risk player with positive emotions, so if you're risk uh, if you're if if you're the kind of person who takes risks and you're a positive personality, not depressive, n- no negative emotions, holding a crocodile is going to make you like, "I held a crocodile. I'm going to win." And take more risks. Yeah, Maybe it's they just like ha- crocodiles, and it made them happy. Well, it's interesting that it, it, so they were being primed by this this crocodile, crocodile holding to 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 sort of give them a, a, a to to have a different impulse after. But it's interesting that um, those impulses were divergent. Uh, mm-hmm. You know th- that priming wasn't controllable in a cer- certain direction, but actually sent them off in different directions. That's right. really fascinating. Absolutely. That means you might, you're might you less likely to be handed a crocodile next time you go to a casino because hmm. only some of the players right. will, will bet more, some will bet less. Because otherwise, and, they'd be handed them out be- left and right. Oh, yeah. It's like, come on down and pet a crocodile for free. Yeah. The anatomy prize goes to the UK for a medical research study. Why do old men have big ears? Oh, 
Because the myth is, or like the old thing that you always say, right, is that cartilage keeps growing as you age, right? Isn't that already known? Or is that that not? Oh, it's already known. Ah, They should have Googled it first. Yeah, so it was basically they, this was this question. People said, well, you know, it's very true. And so then, then they figured it out. They set out to answer the question. Do your so ears it's get correct. Bigger? Do your ears get bigger as you get older? Yes, they do. Okay. So yes, there we do. go. Cool. <laughs> well, you know, it could have been this whole time. It could have been this whole time our skulls were shrinking. And yeah. we just didn't notice it. Or because you lose your hair, your ears appear larger. Bifocals add a pound and a half to a nose. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is how this works. <laughs> Biology prize to Japan, Brazil, Switzerland for their discovery of a female penis and a male vagina in a cave insect. Um, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, what then determines the sex of the um, insect? The chromosomes. The gametes. Yeah, the gametes. The, gametes the, chromosomes. Mm-hmm. the genitalia don't necessarily determine it. That's just how things came out on the outside. Well, it's the genes. That's, we, okay. we've, we've definitely reported on inseminatory yeah. organs in females that yeah. are. I mean, come on. The hyena. Protruding. Not, it doesn't have a, it has a pseudo penis. Yes. And I, I'm going to mess up the words, but does this just mean that these are transgender insects and that we've discovered that this is just part of nature? I wouldn't call them transgender, nor would I call them hermaphroditic, because they are still only one. They are they have one set of sex chromosomes, so they are very clearly one or the other. It's you just might have to know about preferences, like what the it, insect. It's more. It's it's, it's more about so the mechanics. What mechanics does this type of animal use? So that would be the question, right? Would be to observe these animals mating and to see how they use them. It looks like they use them up. A- Appropriately, right? Yeah. Um, so, so interesting. So they found these insects in the genus Neotrogla, so Socodia prenongloridae from the from Brazilian caves. The females have a highly elaborate penis-like structure, the gynosome, while males lack an intromittent organ. The gynosome has species-specific elaborations such as numerous spines that fit species-specific pouches in the simple male genitalial, genital chamber. And during prolonged copulation, about 40 to 70 hours, a large and potentially nutritious ejaculate is transferred from the male via the gynosome. The correlated genital evolution in Neotrogla is probably driven by reversed sexual selection with females competing for seminal, seminal gifts. So... So just to get this this right, the first chance that we know of where the females have the... The organ, um, but the sperm still comes from the male. Yeah, okay. But the first instance that we have where the female has the penetrating organ... Yes. Oh, you're, you're referring to the spikes? Yeah, no, it, it, it lasts for 40-something hours? <laughs> yes. And it spiked. That's right. And it spiked. Okay. That's called All right. payback. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what it sounds like. It's just like... Yep, and, and it has species-specific characteristics. So it's it, uh, the female organ has evolved intricately and has very adaptive adaptive radiation. Fluid Dynamics Prize to South Korea and the USA for studying the dynamics of liquid sloshing. Oh, this is good. To stir, to, to learn what happens when a person walks backward while carrying a cup of coffee. Okay. <laughs> Entitled, A Study on the Coffee Spilling Phenomena in the Low Impulse Regime. Huh. Okay. So, so... Uh, mildly interested just to know because I haven't I don't know that I've tried to walk backwards with a cup of coffee for, for a prolonged period of time but I'm gonna try oh, that I definitely really have. you should try yeah. it I'm you gonna try that it. and I'm gonna just to see is it is it harder to predict the fluid dynamics of my cup if I'm walking backwards yeah I don't know if it is one would have I'm gonna have to try 
Yeah. Maybe I, I think we should all drink coffee walking backwards. Yeah. See what could possibly go wrong. Let's see what, let's see what happens. The Nutrition Prize for Brazil, Canada, and Spain for the first scientific report of human blood in the diet of the hairy-legged vampire bat. Called, What is for Dinner? First report of human blood in the diet of the hairy-legged vampire bat. Ooh, adorable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Human blood from, in a vampire bat diet. They're feeding on us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the medicine. Just a lot of mosquitoes. Yeah, maybe that's it. Also, mm -hmm. who have eaten, mm -hmm. fed on humans? Exactly. Medicine Prize, France and UK, for using advanced brain scanning technology to measure the extent to which some people are disgusted by cheese. Pardon? <laughs> Seriously, the title of the study is "The Neural Bases of Disgust for Cheese: An Fmri Study." Oh. I'll take their cheese. I will take your cheese. I'll take your cheese, cheese, friends. How does the brain respond to stinky cheese? Maybe that's the, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> the cognition. But everyone knows the stinkier, the more delicious. Or, or, yeah. or, or, or you respond with taking a shot of schnapps immediately after eating. That's also no. Ew, schnapps. That's no, you pair, way, it, a, you pair it with the appropriate wine. wine. Yeah, duh. The, the real stinky cheese that they drink in uh, Denmark does not go well with wine. You have to follow it with some <laughs> schnapps. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> field trip. That's right, field trip. All right. The Cognition Prize goes to Italy, Spain, and the UK for their demonstrating that many identical twins cannot tell themselves apart visually. The study is called, Is That Me or My Twin? Lack oh. of Self-Face Recognition Advantage in Identical Twins. Wow. And this is not behind a paywall. You can find this on PLOS One. So anyone oh, can read cool. this study. Yeah. Well, I have that's trouble cool. telling me and my brother apart in like baby pictures. But that's a baby picture. Like if you yeah. were a twin, yeah. you would yeah. show in a picture of your twin, you would imagine that you'd see something in the face that would mm -hmm. distinguish, right? That you've grown up close together. Yeah. Yeah. You know what though? No. You know what though? Just out of just out of uh economic convenience to the brain, most of the time you do that in pictures, I bet you're just looking at the outfit. If you're a twin. <laughs> and you're like, oh, that's her shirt. Or I don't know, I don't own that. Right. Shirt. I don't own that. Right. Yeah. So then when it's just the face, now you're like, oh, I haven't really had to try this. Right. <laughs> but suddenly this is difficult. And really, you're never trying to tell yourself apart from your twin because you know you are apart from your twin. Right, exactly. You see them. Yes. You don't see you. Oh, don't we're both looking you. in the mirror. Which one am I? Which one am I? <laughs> <laughs> you're the one on the right. Relax. You got, you got this. You can figure it out. It's okay. And finally, the obstetrics prize goes to Spain for showing that a developing human fetus responds more strongly to music that is played electromechanically inside the mother's vagina than to music that is played electromechanically on the mother's belly. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so they have, um, uh, the reference title is Fetal Facial Expression in Response to Intravaginal Music Emission. Okay. And they have a patent now Oh, for no. No, a no, fetal no. acoustic stimulation no. device. No. The product is named Baby Pod. No. <laughs> no, honey, this is. No. I know, I know, I know. You want me to talk to the baby, but but based on what I heard on Twist last week, no. this is how I have to do okay, it. Okay, so I just my brain just jumped to a Mister Microphone. Remember those, but one yeah. with an attachment. <laughs> Right. Hey, baby. <laughs> Special. Yeah. This oh, is how. No. You know, don't, don't don't talk to the belly. Talk to the vagina. Oh no. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No thanks. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Okay. That made me laugh. That was fabulous. Thanks, Ig Nobel. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Once again, Ig Nobel Prizes awarded, and uh, I guess for the first time every year, um, 
and they kind of make fun of some of the fun in science. Some of the some of the whimsy oh in gosh. scientific. Yeah, you might call that one whimsy for sure. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call it whimsy. All right, so we've got some actual not improbable science to talk about right now. I've been talking for a long time. Am I gonna keep talking now? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Yeah. I can I can do my story and then you go back to your stories, but it's up to you however you want to do it. Yeah, why don't you do a story? I'm tired of talking. Yeah. Go, Justin, uh, go. So uh, by the year 2100, the world may have tipped into unknown territory. And while the future is always unknown territory, there is some reason for concern that the atmosphere is on collision course with global extinction. Destiny. Great late. <laughs> Ancient carbon anomalies occurring over thousands, millions of years to today's disruptions, which have taken place in just this century or a little more in a century. In the past 540 million years, the Earth has endured five mass extinction events, each involving processes that upended the normal cycling of carbon through the atmosphere and oceans. Daniel Rothman, professor of geophysics at MIT, analyzed significant changes in the carbon cycle over that 450, uh, 540 million years, including the five mass extinction events, identified thresholds of catastrophe in the carbon cycle that if exceeded would lead to an unstable environment and ultimately mass extinction. In a paper published in Science Advances, he proposes the mass extinction occurs if one of two thresholds are crossed. One, changes in the carbon cycle that occur over long time scales Extinction will follow if these changes occur at rates faster than global ecosystems can adapt. And two, carbon cycle changes that take place over shorter time scales. The pace of carbon cycle changes themselves won't matter. Instead, it's the size or magnitude of the change itself, which will determine the likelihood of an extinction event. These are two sort of different things that he was looking at. Uh, taking this reasoning forward in time, Rothman predicts that given the rise in carbon dioxide emissions of a relatively short time scale, a sixth extinction will depend on whether a critical amount of carbon is added to the oceans. That amount, he calculates, is about 310 gigatons, which he estimates, estimates will be roughly equivalent to the amount of carbon that human activities will have added to the world's oceans by the year 2100. Now... This That's does not what, mean... 80, 82 years from now? That's forever Plenty into the time. future. Plenty of time. We'll be dead and gone. It's our <laughs> kid's problem. Who cares? Right? But I, this does not mean 2100, party over with, out of time. Out of time, yeah. Rothman says it would normally take a while, about 10,000 years, for such ecological disasters to play out. However, he says that by 2100, the world may have tipped into unknown territory. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of this is because we haven't really seen an example of this in this time scale. Rather says it's saying that if left unchecked, the carbon cycle would move into a realm which would no would be no longer stable. We would behaving would be behaving in a way that would we would find difficult to predict the geologic past. This type of behavior is associated with mass extinction. <clears throat> So he's did some work in the past on the end per Permian extinction, most severe extinction in the Earth's history with a massive pulse of carbon through the Earth's system was involved in wiping out more than 95% of marine species worldwide. So time to figure out, is are we getting to that kind of a thing? Is that even possible? How can you really compare these great events of the geologic past, which occur over such vast time scales, on to what's going on today? which is centuries at the longest, Rothman says. So I sat down one summer day and tried to think about how one might go about this systematically. So he used math, diverged, uh, derived a simple mathematical formula based on the basic principles that relates to critical rate and magnitude of change in the carbon cycle to the time scale that separates fast from slow change. He hypothesized that this formula should predict whether mass extinction or some sort of global catastrophe should occur. He then asked whether history followed his hypothesis. By searching through hundreds of published 
geochemistry papers, he identified 31 events in, that, in the past 542 million years, in which a significant change occurred in the Earth's carbon cycle. For each event, including the five mass extinctions, Rothman noted the change in carbon expressed in the geochemical record as a change in the relative abundance of two isotopes, carbon-12 and carbon-13. He also noted the duration of time over which the changes occurred. He then devised a mathematical transformation to convert these quantities to the total mass of carbon that was added to the oceans during each event. Finally, he plotted both the mass and the time scale of each event. It became evident that there was a characteristic rate of change that the system basically didn't like to go past, Rothman says. He observed a common threshold that most of the 31 events appeared to stay under. While these events involved significant changes in carbon, they were relatively benign, not in, in that they didn't destabilize the system towards the catastrophe end. In contrast, four of the five mass extinction events lay over the threshold, with the most severe end Permian extinction being the furthest over the line. Upon further analysis, Rothman found the critical rate for catastrophes related to Earth's natural carbon cycle. That cycle is a loop between photosynthesis, respiration. Normally, there's a leak in the cycle, which small amounts of organic carbon sinks to the bottom of the ocean. Over time, is buried as sediment, sequestered from the rest of the carbon cycle. So even when you've got the buildup, there's usually something leaking out of that system. Uh, production of more carbon dioxide then can leak out, and the leak is then plugged. Carbon cycle drifts towards that unstable territory. Critical rate appears only beyond the time scale in which the marine cycle can reestablish its equilibrium after disturbed. Today, right. he says that time scale is about 10,000 years. But for much shorter events... Like what we're doing right now. Like what we're doing now, yeah. the critical threshold is no longer tied to the rate at which carbon is added to the oceans, but instead the carbon's total mass. So we're in that scenario. Both scenarios would leave an excess of carbon circulating through the oceans and atmosphere, likely resulting in global warming and ocean acidification. From the critical rate and equilibrium timescales, Rothman calculated the critical mass of carbon for the modern day to be that 310 gigatons. Best case scenario through the IPCC's reports, projects uh, predicts that humans will add 300 gigatons of carbon to the oceans by 2100. Mm -hmm. There is, however, a worst case scenario, which is more than 500 gigatons, far exceeding the critical threshold. In all scenarios, Rothman shows that by 2100, the carbon cycle will either be close to or well beyond the threshold for catastrophe. There should be ways of pulling back emissions of carbon dioxide, Rothman says, but this work points out reasons why we need to be careful and it gives more reasons for studying the past to inform the present. Mm -hmm. Studying the past is always important for informing the present. Absolutely. But uh, 2100, we have time. I mean, we to, have these worst case scenarios that have been, uh, that keep being piled on us for uh, emissions trajectories that are putting 2050 and, you know, other much closer dates into our minds and making it seem as if uh, we are already past the point of no return. And so to potentially have someone say, we, could, we have a little longer, mm -hmm. that's nice. But that what? little longer I means this big, big bad coming, not yes. just right. a little so, bad coming, a big so bad. I want yeah, to and it's not that time to do whatever you want. It's time for us to we build to infrastructure to yeah. adjust how we do things. But it gives us a little longer to make yeah. that happen and to yeah. not be so panicked. Right. And hopefully no, we will. No, it doesn't. Wait, yeah. wait. Yeah, I think you're misreading. So there, he's looking nothing about this point of no return. He's talking about the levels that that have led to mass extinctions in the past. That's right. not to say that 2050, or 2050 isn't already a point beyond which that carbon cycle is out of whack and going in the wrong direction further. Doesn't mean that at all. However, it does still add just another layer onto why aren't we doing something really aggressive about this right now? Um, and and I, I don't Still know. Panic, I think but maybe panic. 
It's, <laughs> it's, it's it's no, no, no. I think I think it's, it's more. Okay if you panic productively. It's more. It's urgent, but it's fixable. Yes. It's urgent. It's, it's fixable. It's Let's fixable. do something about it. It's urgent. It's fixable. I think Let's that's stop really putting so much carbon into the oceans. Let's do that. We can do that. Yeah, we can do that. Totes. Totes, my goats. Okay. Well, that's oh my like God. That. We're never going to get it done. But okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, oh, you got him, people. cancer, tumors. They're oh, just more fun stuff. Huh? More fun stuff. I'm just bring up the fun stuff now. Um, but this is actually a potentially positive study. Um, researchers published this week in Science their investigation of some kinds of tumors. They were, uh, there's some tumors, cancer cases like pancreatic cancer, um, among others, breast cancer even, that do not respond well to chemotherapy. And the researchers have been trying to figure out why don't these tumor cells respond? What's going on? Why don't the chemotherapy drugs work? Well, they found out that there are certain drug, uh, that there, these drug resistant cancers can potentially be defeated if you use antibiotics <clears throat> right alongside the regimen. Dun, dun, dun. What they found is that uh, they got this idea to look for bacteria in their tumors when they found that uh, when certain cells in the lab became more resistant to a chemotherapy drug that's called gemcitabine. And this drug treats pancreatic, lung, breast, and bladder cancers sold under the name Gemzar, Gemzar. Um, and so they went looking for a molecule or something that would be fighting and breaking the chemotherapy drug. They've passed their, two, they made a broth out of the tumor cells and passed it through a, a sieve to try and catch bits and pieces, molecules. But what they found were pretty large particles that were bacteria. And they found that their cancer cells were contaminated with a kind of bacteria that is called mycoplasma hyorhinus. Mycoplasma hyorhinus metabolizes gemcitabine, making it useless. And so when they treated mice with and without this M. hyorhinus, they took mice, and some of them had this bacteria infecting them and others didn't. They had cancer. And the ones without the bacteria, the treatment worked just fine. The ones with the bacteria, they were resistant to treatment. And so then they went on and they discovered the gene that allows this bacteria to metabolize the drug. It's a gene called CDDL. And they found it's really common, not only in this bacteria, but also they found uh, about 2,700 bacteria that had a gene for eating up gemcitabine. So throw out every chemotherapy study in the past that showed <laughs> ranges of working for some but not others and a lot of the pathways that we've gone down and trying to determine well based on your genes which chemotherapy might work for you and and those ineffective treatments that uh, got shelved uh, bring them all back, retest everything because... <laughs> With antibiotics. Yeah, now so they, we have a... Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so they have not tested this. They've tested it on human cells, but they have not tested it on humans yet. And so they don't have the go-ahead to actually use the antibiotics with the chemotherapy, although this is the kind of thing that could be easily implemented um, in a medical treatment scenario. So, uh, but the basic breakdown of this is if they treat mice that have cancer that can be treated with this particular drug, this gemcitabine, and an antibiotic, the bacteria disappear and the tumors shrink. Wow. And, and the tumor, if, if the bacteria are there, 
and they don't use the antibiotic, the tumors progress and they, they don't, they're not treatable. So the authors conclude this merits additional exploration. That's what they conclude. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's a All right. that's yeah. pretty exciting though, actually. I think yeah. that's that's the big question with a lot of cancer treatment is why does it come back? Why does it work part why way? Didn't it work? Yeah. So, so for it, some people it opens a lot of doors. Yeah, absolutely. For some people that's for huge. some kind yeah. for some types of cancers, and this opens the door to other researchers who are looking at different chemotherapy drugs and different cancers to kind of maybe do the same kind of check mm -hmm. and say, mm -hmm. are there other bacteria or yes. different or what else could be in there that we hadn't thought of? Right. Yeah. And if bacteria are metabolizing chemotherapy drugs, that might also mean that with an antibiotic treatment first, you could use a much lower dosage of chemotherapy mm. drugs because it, the whole reason you were using so much is because you were overcoming something that was metabolizing them while they were circulating through the body. And yeah. so you had to keep using more to get an effective rate. And maybe you, there's another way. Oh, wouldn't, so wouldn't many questions nice? and paths and avenues so and possible questions. drugs that were pulled off the market because they weren't strong enough, which actually might have been fine if the stream, wow. Yeah. So maybe wow. there is a whole area of... About the last 20 years of cancer <laughs> uh, research uh, started <laughs> over with the little antibiotic treatment first. Yeah. Ooh. Seriously, go back and do a big review and see. I mean, and the, the great thing is, is now they have looking at the genetics of it. Maybe there's a, for at least some drugs that have a particular confirmation, maybe now they'll be able to say, okay, these bacteria could have been getting in the way. And so, yeah, let's go back and try it again. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, new, new direction. And in other kind of interesting, good uh, direction in medicine, Alzheimer's disease, it uh, disrupts the lives of many aging individuals. And for years we have said that, oh yeah, that's these, these plaques that form, right? The amyloid plaques that form from beta amyloid. Um, and it's been the, the really the primary thought of cause of the disease for many years. However, there's been a lot of evidence. It's like, nah, there's this other protein this variant of apolipo, apolipoprotein E, the ApoE4, that has been looked at as well. And then there's other stuff involved in Alzheimer's, the tau tangles. So you've got the beta amyloid plaques and you've got tau tangles. And people have said, well, maybe it's just the tau tangles. And so there have been these competing fields hypothesizing on what the cause is and what the what drugs should should attack and what should be going on. So every anyway, a new research study which is being called seminal by leaders in the field. Also Bob Vassar, a molecular biologist at North Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois, says it has profound clinical implications. It because it shifts the terms of this debate over what Alzheimer's should focus on, the beta amyloid plaques or the tau tangles, saying both of them because they're interrelated through ApoE4. And so you could target them both by targeting the ApoE4. Mm. Yeah. So this is a, a potentially a change making kind of study in the way that the field looks at things. Yeah. Yes. And the researchers, found that uh, in this, this study is published in Nature, they took, uh, they took genetically engineered mice that produced tau protein and that's similar to what's found in Alzheimer's brains and they crossbred them with strains of mice that expressed ApoE4 or ApoE2 or ApoE3, the variants, the human variants of this apolipoprotein E protein. They also crossed these mice, the tau mice, with mice with disabled apolipoprotein E. So they didn't have any. And then they looked at the brain tissue from the different mixes, the crosses of these mice. And they found that the mice that were carrying the human variants of ApoE had tau tangles and neurodegeneration with the most tissue loss 
and death in the ApoE4 mice. The tau mice that didn't have any ApoE gene, there was little or no neuronal death. And so they're saying it proves, provides definitive evidence, quote, quote, definitive evidence that ApoE plays a major role in this tau pathology. And then they looked, they took immune cells that are part of the brain's immune system, microglia and astrocytes, from mice with this ApoE4, and they grew them in culture with neurons with the human tau protein. And the immune cells attacked and killed the tau neurons. Ah! And so this could be, this could be the mechanism, ApoE4 or apolipoprotein E interacts with the tau protein and says, kill, and sends the immune cells on the attack to disrupt and uh, destroy the neurons that express it. And then that would cause plaques and tangles and all sorts of trouble. So this could be the new direction of Alzheimer's treatments. Going up the river, finding the connector, finding the root cause. We're getting closer, everyone. Closer and closer. Maybe someday there will be a treatment and people will not go into the dark, dark, long, forgetful night. Great. Oh. That would be fantastic. Yeah. That would be wonderful. You know what time it is right now? Break time. It's not a break time. Oh. No way. This is This Week in it's Science. And right now... Time. It's there. time for Blair's Animal Corner. She loves a creature, cry that small. Five pet, little pet, no pet at all. Want to hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. That I won't know. What you got, Blair? Oh my goodness, I almost forgot how to do the show, but <laughs> don't forget. I have some exciting animal news for you this week, starting with velvet spiders. Velvet spiders are from Southern Africa, and they are one of just 20 known species of spiders that are social. That's out of the 50,000 species of spiders on this planet. So most spiders, as we've talked about on the show, they go it alone for their entire lives. Even mating can be kind of contentious and touch and go. <laughs> they really like their space. Death causing. De little, light touch of death occasionally. Um, yep. But velvet spiders are one of these groups of spiders that work cooperatively. And that's because they they don't have sticky webs. When they put their webs together, they don't have glue droplets. And so they also, that also means it doesn't catch much detritus, so they don't need to be renewed, which means these webs, they can just keep building and building and building on them till they have this kind of uh, giant complex of webs. And so they work together to build this giant web structure and maintain it. And they also work together to maintain their nests and raise young. Prior research has shown that after laying eggs and tending to them until they hatch, these little spiderlings come out and eat their mother alive. Yeah. They inject their chemical chemicals into her body that dissolve her organs, and this provides her uh, provides her baby some much needed nutrients. Well, new research from Ernst Moritz Arndt. University in Germany, if I did that all right, and Aarhus University in Denmark have captured about 200 female spiders, these velvet spiders, some of which were about to lay eggs. They were uh, expectant mothers, and some of them were virgins. And they color marked these groups and watched what happened in the lab over 10 weeks. In 97% of cases, both mated and virgin spiders tended to eggs and also to the spiderlings that emerged. They also observed that as the spiderlings hatched, they ate both the mothers and the virgin adult females. Also, the good of the community 
for the good of the community. Exactly. And this is all talk because about, talk about a spider's handmade tale. Yes. Oh my God. So not only dying a virgin, but being eaten by tiny children that aren't <laughs> yours. That aren't yours. Um, but kind so of take care of them. Kind of. Where these where these spiders live. Food is really hard to find. It's dry. Water's hard to find. So they make the ultimate sacrifice for these spiderlings to live. This is the question that now remains unresolved. Before the young eat the adults, the adults go through a physical process. They go through a chemical change internally, which makes it possible for the young to eat them. Uh, the researchers call it analogous to a mammal's chemistry changing before they begin lactation. So for whatever reason, it makes it easier and better for the spiders to eat them after this chemical change. And this chemical change happens in both the mothers and the virgin females. How? Yeah. What is the signaling process that yeah. causes this to happen in virgin females? as well as the mothers. Maybe because the virgin females are around. Yeah, could be babies. hormones. Could yeah, be hormones. could be the activity of caring for the young yeah. changes their hormonal profile. It could be something that they're picking up from the eggs. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Who knows? Yeah. Man, but, but what, what's happening is that it's probably, it's got to be oxytocin relaxing them and making it so they're like, yeah, it's cool. I won't run away. Go, Go ahead and eat, eat me. me. Yeah, yeah. That's sort of a you know an interesting survival technique, but those 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 young though just just so everybody's clear, those young spiders that are devouring their mother and their aunts or their cousins or whoever they are, mm -hmm. um, will one day grow up to, to help raise a batch of spiders that are gonna eat them. Yeah, so, it's the circle of life. It's just beautiful. Waste not, want not. I guess. Just brings brings a tear to the eye. Just I bet that spider venom. Majesty. Majesty of nature. That's not a tear. <laughs> that's just spider venom rolling out of your tear duct. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and so moving from uh, cannibalistic spiders to killer frogs. So I want to tell you a story about my favorite kind of frog. Yes, I have a favorite of kind of frog. You might have recognized that now three years in a row, the twist calendar has a certain resident on its cover, and that's called a horned frog. They're also known as Pac-Man frogs, and these are by far wacka, my favorite wacka, wacka, wacka. frogs. They're called that because they're basically these round piles with a giant mouth. So they look kind of like Pac-Man. The reason that they are that shape, though, is that unlike other frogs, they are ambush predators and they are carnivores and they are pretty good at catching large prey. So they can catch, they can catch mice, lizards, snakes, even birds. These little frogs that are that are no bigger than, you know, four or five inches and so because so the way they catch these animals, they kind of like bury down into the dirt so you can barely see them. All they have are their two little heads, their two little eyes poking out, right? And then um, they can see an animal scurrying past and they jump out and grab them with this huge mouth. So because of that, they have developed a fantastic bite force. But up until now, no one has actually measured frog bite force. We talk a lot about who would win a shark or a tiger and stuff like that. And they do all sorts of tests on bite force in these animals. But so far, frogs have not gotten the test. Well, this new study looked at it in particular to try and figure out what the, the now extinct ancient frog called Beelzebufo. Beelzebufo, like Beelzebub. Yeah. Yes. That lived about 68 million years ago, in Mad meals ago, years ago in Madagascar would have eaten. So to figure out what Beelzebufo would have eaten, they took, because this, this frog was in structure and shape and mouth size and all these sorts of things, uh, very analogous to a Pac-Man or a horned frog, they can do a series of experiments on the bite force of current day 
horn frogs and extrapolate from there, do some mathematics. So what they did, this is a study from University of Adelaide, California State Poly Polytechnic University in Pomona, University of California, Riverside, and University of College London. This was quite the the undertaking they found that the large south american horn frogs have similar bite forces to those of mammalian predators Whoa. yes Wait, well which mammalian predators that's okay. well let me tell you yeah. so they found that small horn frogs at the head of about four and a half centimeters pretty small can bite with a force of 30 newtons or about three kilograms or six and a, six and a half pounds ish Scaling that, they were able to compare the bite force with head and body size. They could calculate large horn frogs in South America with a head width up to 10 centimeters. So over twice that would have a bite size of almost 500 newtons. This is comparable to reptiles and mammals with similar head size. And they say this would feel like having 50 liters of water balanced on your fingertip. And if you, if you feel brave later, you can do some YouTube searches of people being stupid about their pet horn frogs. They dangle their <laughs> finger in front of the horn frog and you watch them get bit and horn frogs don't let go and it looks extremely painful. <laughs> so based on the scaling relationship, they kept going, they extrapolated further. They estimated that the bite force of the giant extinct Beelzebufo which is many ways has proven to be similar to living horned frogs had a bite of up to <laughs> sorry i keep forgetting that i've got a speaker on in a different place my fault <laughs> so beelzebufo beelzebufo may have had a bite of up to 2200 newtons that is comparable to wolves and wow. tigers oh my goodness that's yes an intense... so this bite force and the size of beelzebufo leads researchers to believe that they were likely to have eaten on small and juvenile dinosaurs that shared their environment they ate the a dinosaur eating frog a dinosaur eating frog yes and they did this with um, your uh, force transducer, which is basically just two metal plates at, that they bite onto and it feels the force with which they bite down. Um, that's what they use for other animals too. But yeah, so this 68 million year old, very large frog ate dinosaurs, likely, likely ate dinosaurs. Small dinosaurs. So, so that's, that's one that was missing from all like the Jurassic Park movies. Yes. Right. It would have been great. It's like, quick, we got to hide from the velociraptors. In here, we'll be safe with the frogs. The giant. Yeah. I love oh, frogs. No. Yeah, there's a little horn frog. And then the frog <laughs> eats you. Yeah. I love End of movie. frogs. Oh, maybe that's why they didn't put <laughs> Yes. Them. Well, and the um, frog wins. You can go ahead and, and uh, buy your Twist Animal Corner, <laughs> Blair's Animal Corner calendar. <laughs> Advance. We're taking advances on it right now. You can have your horned frog on the front. Beelzebufo. That's right. Bufo on the cover of the coloring calendar that we're going to be releasing this winter. Yeah, there you go. That'll be fantastic. Yeah. All right. This is another reason why I will not be playing with toads, frogs. Maybe my son will eventually. Frogs are amazing. He gets to feed them. Oh, they're cute. I love them. I love frogs. I love the frogs. All the amphibians. Especially if they ate dinosaurs. All right, you guys. This is This Week in Science. It's time for us to go take a break and eat some dinosaurs. Yum. Yum, yum, yum. It's dinosaur time. No, we're going to take a break so that you can sit and listen to me say some things or listen to the messages that are coming next. This is This Week in Science. Stay tuned. We have lots more science still to come. <laughs>
All right, everybody. Blair already pre-messaged you on the calendar, but we are pre ordering calendars right now. That's right. If you go to twist.org, there is a link at twist.org for you to be able to pre-order the 2018 Twist Blair's Animal Corner calendar. And you know you want to do it because it is full. Every single year, it is full of holidays and fun things you need to know about what is going on in the science world and the interesting world you live in. Additionally, in the twist world, and you get amazing original art from Blair. And this year, it's going to be a coloring calendar. So you can color the art the way that you would like, because maybe you haven't enjoyed the coloring of Blair's previous calendars, because she's colorblind. But that's not true. I think they're amazing. They're amazing. <laughs> I was just being mean. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't look at me like that, Blair. Yes. So the Twist Blair's Animal Corner calendar. This year, it's September. It was a nice jack bunny. And then we've got all sorts of wonderful things going on. Did you know that this week, yesterday, was Talk Like a Pirate Day? Tomorrow is Rosh Hashanah. Friday is World Rhino Day and fall begins. And 20, the 23rd is International Rabbit Day. Next Thursday is World Rabies Day. With the Twist calendar, you can know these things next year too and record the things that you want to do in your own life. Pre-order them now. Go to twist.org. And while you are there at twist.org, why don't you check out some of the other options that we have for the ways you can support Twist. If you click on the Zazzle store link, that will take you to our Zazzle store where you can peruse all of our wonderful items. We've got phone covers, lumbar pillows, mouse pads, mugs, t-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, bags, all sorts of items. You can even get stamps. You can get stamps for your holiday cards if you're sending out holiday cards or your New Year's cards or whatever you do. I don't know. Get a twist stamp. Wouldn't that be cool? Support Twist and share it with people at the very same time. You can do all that over at Zazzle. The Twist logo is all over things as well as much of Blair's art from previous calendars. So you too can get your hands on some of that art if you missed a previous calendar. Then if you go back to twist.org, you can also help us out and support us by helping us produce the show financially. So you can click on the big donate button that's down under the donate to twist box on the sidebar. Click on that. It takes you through a PayPal interface where you can easily donate whatever amount you are you would like to give us to help keep the show going in its current form. If you want to help us on Patreon, you click on that Patreon link in the header bar. That takes you to patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. And once you go to patreon.com, you can become a part of our community over there where our patrons pledge to give us certain amounts of money on an ongoing basis, episode by episode, month after month, to keep the show going. And you know what? You really do keep the show going. And over on Patreon, it's really a little community over there. You get, you get notes and little, little messages every once in a while. Sometimes you get special videos, different things come to you before they come to other people. Patreon, it's an awesome place to be. Check it out. But if all this is not your cup of tea, but you still want to help us out, just consider sharing twists with people you know. iTunes, tell them to subscribe. Or maybe on Twitter. Tell people that you're listening to the episode and you really like it and tell people to listen. On Facebook, share the recent episode that you enjoy. Again, tell people to listen. Tell them to check it out. Tell them what you like about it. If you're on YouTube, you can even link to specific segments of the show and send people directly to the stories that you were telling them about during cocktail hour so that they can listen to those parts of the show. When they said, no way, that's not true, you can say, believe me, here's the podcast. Send them on YouTube. So many different ways. Help us grow our community. Help us produce the show. Be a part of it even more than you already are. Because you know what? We really could not do this without you. Thank you for your support. Man's from holy men leaves me slightly queasy deep down in the abdomen. Convinced that the lives that they lead need adjusting. They drive to the bookstore and blindly start trusting the miracles and cures all laid down in black ink. Never even.
And we're back with more this weekend science. Oh, yeah, we are. Justin, what you got? Rapa Nui, known as Easter Island by people who don't live there and probably can't find it on a map without Googling it, has been confounding Europeans since 1722. Early visitors estimated a population of just 1,500 to 3,000, which is all well and good. However, it does seem a bit at odds with the 900 giant statues dotted around the island. How did this small community construct, transport, and erect these large rock figures? A new study published in the open access journal Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution hopes to unravel the mystery by giving the best estimate yet of the maximum population size sustained by Easter Island in its heyday. Quote a voice. Despite its almost complete isolation, the inhabitants of Easter Island created a complicated social structure and these amazing works of art before a dramatic change occurred, said Dr. Cedric Pulston, lead author of the study based in the Department of Anthropology, University of California, Davis, who probably doesn't sound like this at all. We've, <laughs> we've tried to solve one piece of the puzzle. I'll just continue because I started that way to figure out the maximum population size before it fell. It appears the island could have supported 17,500 people at its peak, which represents the upper end of a range of previous estimates. He adds, if the population fell from 17,500, I've committed now, I've got to keep doing it, to the smaller number that missionaries counted many years after European contact, it presents a very different picture from the maximum population of 3,000 or less, as some have suggested. Previous archaeological evidence implies the indigenous people numbered Far greater than that 1,500 to 3,000 individuals encountered in the 18th century. Population history of the island remains, though, highly controversial. In addition to internal conflict, population crash has been attributed to ecocide, which the island's resources were exhausted by its inhabitants, reducing its ability to support human life. We think we might have touched on a story that uh, refuted that to some extent previously. Paulson and his colleagues examined the art agricultural potential of the island before these events occurred. And calculate the maximum sustainability. The project involved a number of really good researchers, including archeologists, a local expert in Rapa Nui culture, a soil scientist, a biochemist, and a population biologist to get through, or to get a thorough picture of what the island was like before European contact. Sorry, Paulson. <laughs> we examined detailed maps, took soil samples around the island, placed weather stations, used population models, and estimated sweet potato production. When we had doubts about one of these factors, we looked at the range of its potential values to work out different scenarios. They found 19% of the island could have been used to grow sweet potatoes, which was the main food crop, by using information on how birth and death rates at various ages depends on food availability. The researchers calculated the population size that, uh, size that level of production could have sustained. The result is a wide range of possible maximum population sizes, but to get the smallest values, you have to assume the worst of everything, says Paulston. If we continue, if we compare our agriculture estimates with those of other Polynesian islands, the population of 17,500 people on this size of island is entirely reasonable. He concludes that Easter Island is a fascinating place because it, re it represents an extreme example of a natural experiment in human adaptation which began when people from a single culture group spread quickly across the islands of the Pacific. Different environments they encountered on these islands generated tremendous amounts of variation in human behavior as an extremely unusual case in both its cultural achievements and its ecological transformation. Eland, uh, Easter Island uh, is remarkable and important. But the thing I always I think is like, okay, so yeah, it seemed... You know, 1,500 or 3,000 people creating all those giant works of art on the island? Very improbable, right? 17,500. We got a lot more workers out there. Kind of makes more sense. It sort of fits. But then I'm like looking around. I'm like, the city populations, you know, in the county that I live in, there's very few communities under 17,000 people and no great works of art that are just like you would drive by and like, oh, this is the township of Winters, where they erected giant works of art to the saga. Like, there's it's like nothing in comparison. So, regardless of the population, 
right? Notwithstanding Rapa Nui's past, still that thing that we're only going to know them as that separates them apart from all other islands that immediately we can see one of their works of art and know it came from them. These people created it. Uh, that's the, the wonderful story there. Create works. Listen, all of you small towns across the world, build giant works of art that, 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 that history will remember you by. Even if it's a giant dinosaur next to a gas station, people will remember seeing that. Yeah, well, that's like, uh, what is it in, I forgot the town in like Central America, in the Plain States, there's a town that was in the path of the eclipse. And they didn't really realize they were going to be in a path of an eclipse at any point, but they created Carhenge, where oh. they took all sorts of automobiles. Of that. Yeah, yeah and awesome. they stacked them up like Stonehenge, but it's automobiles. And uh, it was a, a major, major location for people to attend during the eclipse. But it, it was oh my goodness. for some time. Rapa Nui, Easter <laughs> Island. It, it's, it's the greatest case for public... Uh, uh, public works of art. This is this is look how this well they've been. Rad. I want to go to Nebraska immediately. You want to? It's Nebraska for car hinge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. That by the way, that's that's the only thing in Nebraska. No, there's that, horse farms also. <laughs> that is art. But I think that I think a big thing that could probably be said also is even though it was a small population of people, 17,500 people, maybe um, that you have also top down rule. You know, you had a ruler with an idea that people could get behind who would say, we're going to make this big art. And everyone went, yeah. And they spent their spare hours or all of their hours carving and moving giant pieces of rock. Well, yeah, and then that's the other thing you think. I got to think, like, maybe life was actually so good. You know, the uh, sweet potato yeah. crop was so abundant. Everything was working so fine. There was time to apply to the arts and maybe nothing else to do on the island, too. That's also part of it. Like, what are we going to do? That's I know. Artistic. Like giant head statues that, you know, <laughs> that will that's frighten all... anybody who might come to the island and want to take it from us. So I'll see that and I'll just head the other way. And we'll confuse scientists and visitors for... For a long time. For centuries to come. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a big practical joke on the rest of history. What, are we gonna, what else is there to do on the island? They didn't have internet, right? Right. right. All right. So I, you know, I, I, I have, I'm curious and confused about things that are in space. You know, there are a lot of people on this hunk of rock we call Earth who are like, oh, yeah, I got, it's nice here. I got sweet potatoes. Maybe I'll look at space. Go look for other planets where I could put giant rock sculptures to scare off intruders. <laughs> yes, not really. But we do have a very active exoplanet discovery exercise going on at the moment with Kepler and now with Hubble going through and looking at some of these exoplanets that Kepler has discovered. NASA's Hubble te telescope this week reported on an exoplanet that was reported, was discovered a few years back. It's called WASP-12b. It's a hot Jupiter. So it's, it's large, it's gaseous. And this one is really hot because it's really close to its sun. It is so close to its sun, in fact, that its orbit takes about one day. Earth day. Just hmm. hmm. spinning around and it's it's just zipping around the sun and it's right, right next to it. And it's very hot because it's getting all the energy from its star, right? I said sun, but it's sun, it's star. All right. So researchers have determined that this planet is tidally locked. It's very close. So the gravitational pull of the sun has treated that planet somewhat the way that the earth has affected the moon, where only one side of the planet faces its star all the time. One side is daylight all the time, and one side is nighttime all the time. So this NASA press release comes out. I go check out the NASA press release, and at first I'm nodding my head and going, yeah, yeah, they discovered, wow, they checked it out, what they looked at, they watch this planet 
zipping around its star. And they looked at the eclipse. So normally when we, ch when we find that a planet is around a star, we look for the dimming of the starlight when the planet passes between us and the star because the planet is blocking the light from the star, right? Right. This time they looked at the eclipse moment. So they looked at, because they realized it's tidally locked, they wanted to know, um, when they looked at the eclipse moment when this planet moved behind the star. And they looked at the luminosity of the star and they wanted to see, okay, here we've got, we're looking at the dip in light, the dip in the luminosity as it transits in front of, but then when it goes around the side and you've got the daylight side kind of in view, there's an increase in the luminosity of the star. And most planets, they're going to have some clouds or something. There's going to be some albedo and there's going to be something reflecting back. And so you're going to have the light of the star, the luminosity of the star, plus the added light from reflectance from the planet. And so when a planet eclipses behind a star, normally you see a dip in light that is equal to the amount of reflectance hmm. from the planet. And so it gives some amount, uh, some idea of the albedo of the planet and what's going on in the atmosphere. So they checked out this WASP-12b and they were expecting a dip because they were expecting, okay, most hot Jupiters reflect about 40% of their star's light. They didn't see a dip. There was no dip. No dip. And so what they realized is that on the daylight side of the planet, even though there's water vapor in the atmosphere as a whole, most of the water vapor that can collect as clouds is not collecting as clouds on the daylight side of the planet. It's doing that on the cooler nighttime side of the planet. And the daylight side of the planet is so hot, it's 4,600 degrees Fahrenheit. It's so hot that it's breaking down any molecular bonds that would be trying to form up and form clouds. So clouds can't form and there's no scattering of light and there's no reflectance. So what this, this planet is doing is absorbing light. The molecules that are in there are actually like, thank you for that starlight and they're sucking in light. And so there's no reflectance, there's actually absorb, absorption. And so this, and this all makes sense to me, I got it. But what didn't make sense to me with the NASA press release and the Hubble press release is that they said this is a pitch black planet. Have you guys ever heard of black body radiation? Mm, yeah. If you heat sure. if you if you heat up an iron ingot, what happens to that bit of iron as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter? It glows. It mm -hmm. glows. Mm -hmm. It is emitting light through right. thermal radiation. The thermal radiation actually that radiation actually gives off photons of light that are visible. Mm -hmm. This is a very hot planet. Right. Number one, it's absorbing light, which is going to be converted to more heat. And so it's probably emitting a lot of thermal radiation. So it's mm -hmm. not pitch black. NASA, I don't like the spin on your press release. The reason you did it is because you could go with, oh my God, pitch black planet, and people will be freaking out about a pitch black planet out in space orbiting a star, when the real story here is that researchers were able to observe the eclipsing of this planet and determine that it was so hot that it was not reflecting light, as would be expected in a hot Jupiter planet, but absorbing it. Let's get NASA on the phone. NASA! Whoa! You went NASA. with the sensational angle NASA. and made NASA. me angry. Please hold for Dr. Kiki. She's angry. <laughs> there little, you go. I just a little I have spent hours today. Like this morning, I was explaining things to my son. And I'm like, oh yeah, look at this study, blah, blah, blah. And then Marshall, my husband, comes in and he says, he's like, wait, wait a minute, what about black body radiation? Shouldn't it have some color? And I went, oh my gosh. You're right. And then I went back and I read the study. I read the, the press release again, and I read the other press release, and I've read articles about it, and nobody is getting it right. Nobody. 
And so I would like somebody in the next week, please, in the major media, fix this. Fix it. NASA, fix uh, it. You think he just did, Kiki? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where else, where else are you going to get it? Or if there's a reason that that doesn't apply and they really do think it's black, we need to hear it. It's darker than would be expected is what and and this is the quote that comes from the researcher i am guessing that the person who wrote this press release heard black body regulate radiation and darker than expected right. from yes. from the researcher and went oh it's black it's a pitch the black, black, yeah, black no it's not a pitch black planet and it probably it has a dark side of course which is facing toward us for part of that orbit around its star but its daylight side is emitting thermal radiation mm -hmm. and so it and if you calculate the kelvin 4800 degrees fahrenheit is 2800 degrees kelvin it should be a yellowish or maybe a reddish glow red to yellowish glow depending but maybe there's something i'm not getting this should be this planet should have a bit of a glow to it that would be visible to the naked eye it's not pitch black and it's not a perfect absorber either. It is reflecting a very 6% of the light that is hitting it from its star. So that's like not even perfect black. We have made better black on this planet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right there. You heard Dude. it here, folks. I'm so upset. I don't, this, I don't know why this particular thing, this sensationalization and this inaccuracy, it really, it really made me a little upset. But it's going to keep, keep me awake all night. Oh, no. <laughs> rat to rat and black body radiation. Black body radiation. Yes. And Marshall's oh, like, shh. <sighs> <laughs> he was like, that can't be right. I'm like, you're right. That can't be right. I need to go back and look into this. And I am convinced. I've convinced myself. I am right. NASA yeah. is wrong. <laughs> Snap. Shots fired. Shots fired across the bow. All right, NASA, you heard it. You have to be on the show now. Yeah. The journal article actually says nothing about it being a black planet. Nothing in the article. So this is the press release. It's a press release problem, people, which is being that picked up. Dang the all sensationalism of science. Oh, well. When the real story is actually really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't stand the sensationalism of science. <clears throat> Where are you going next? Where are we going next? Ten researchers <laughs> found non-avian dinosaur living in China. Uh, found, uh, uh, that what had lived in what is now China, uh, laying colored eggs. What? Yeah. That's Many cool. modern birds, as uh, you both know, some are monochrome, all one color, like the blue robin's egg. Others are multicolored, like those of a dove. But until now, it was believed that dinosaur eggs were white. And the reason I thought dinosaur eggs were white is because dinosaur Everybody eggs... buys white eggs at the grocery store. <laughs> yeah. It's a commonly recognizable color of egg. Yes, there's that. So artist renditions probably look to the fridge <laughs> for the color of a dinosaur egg. Maybe make it white, maybe brown. Uh, but white eggs uh, tend to be laid in protected nests. And since dinosaurs tend to lay their eggs in protected nests, that's what people went with scientifically speaking they compared dinosaurs to birds eh, we don't see that with eggs there's other things with eggs but still in this new effort the researchers have found an example of a dinosaur that laid blue or green eggs the team reports that this was their first effort seriously to study a color of dinosaur egg it came about after the team noticed that the heyu ania wangi fossilized egg had a bluish tint in the past, researchers had previously assumed the tint was due to some form of mineral mineralization. Uh, but this new team thought, hey, what if that was the color of the egg? So, uh, yeah, this is uh, the Heyu and Nia Huangyi were dinosaurs with parrot-like beaks that walked on hind legs. And they had feathers. The team used mass spectrometry and Chromatographic separation to take a closer look at the eggs and detected traces of biliardin and protoporphyrin, pigments commonly found in modern colored bird eggs. The eggs were also dated back to the late Cretaceous period, 
which was between 166 million years ago. Coloring, the team suggests, is a strong indication that the eggs were laid in open nests. The coloring would have served as camouflage. Modern birds, only those that lay them in open nests are colored. Their findings also show that egg coloring began before the evolution of modern birds because now they found it in a dinosaur. Uh, and it started in non-avian dinosaurs. So this is this is dinosaurs that weren't uh, later related to birds directly. So that's also interesting. Yeah, I mean, dinosaurs probably laid their eggs in scrapes similar to some of the primitive style open nests that some birds have. And camouflage would have made a very big difference in survival, especially when you've got little, you know, when you've got frogs with giant mouths coming to kill you <laughs> or eat your <laughs> eggs, or there are other little dinosaurs coming to raid your nest and find that if you have white eggs that are out there, they wouldn't stand out. They would stand out and they wouldn't stand up very long. I, I suppose, although I guess I just don't understand uh, bird vision well enough because there's not a lot in nature that's blue. Like, Blue is a very unnatural color. Unless they were trying to blend in with the dinosaur itself. Was the uh, dinosaur yeah. potentially blue? Right, maybe. I mean, a bluebird laying blue eggs or blue robin laying blue eggs. I guess. I but mean, if it's, it's also sort of like weird. a like, combination of blue and green or a blue green color, something that looks like a rock. I yeah, guess, so that's this... really possible. Like emu eggs, I've always been told that they're black. And now, granted, I'm starting at a disadvantage because I mm -hmm. don't see the color super well. But the ones that I've seen up close have looked a lot more green than black to me. But I think I think Kiki's exactly right that that saying blue is probably an oversimplification, and we're picturing like a blue crayon, but or it, an Easter egg, <laughs> right? But it it might be a quote blue that is really just not bright white enough to not catch the eye and kiki you had the picture of a golden eagle egg up there that looks like a rock Good. that looks like it could yeah. just look like some high mountain granite and you would just pass right by it right yeah uh, it would be very interesting to to determine because there is modeling and very interesting gradation of color yeah. on many species eggs uh, of birds and birds have been around evolving for a long time, but dinosaurs were around and evolving for a long time, laying their eggs the whole time. And I would not be surprised if egg coloration got its start way back then. Oh yeah, they're, so well, they're going to take. Aren't some eggs colored the way that they are to prevent brood parasites? Yes. So that could be part of it as oh. well. We don't know. This could be. Oh my gosh, were there brood, brood parasites? Parasite dinosaurs? Yes. Wouldn't that be amazing? dinosaurs being like i'm peeking in your neck oh, i'm i'm gonna lay my egg there i don't have to take care of a baby there we go i'm out of here oh I'm yeah and actually and actually that what's the deal the um brood parasites they they're more successful with colored eggs uh yes. so so if you yeah a multicolored egg is less likely to get kicked out than than one that's uh Right. It's a it's an evolutionary right. arms race. Yeah. yeah. So some of the <laughs> yeah. who are cuckolding each other, I guess, is the yeah. that how it works. Huh. <laughs> huh. Well, that's interesting. interesting. I like yeah. that. Me Bird too. eggs. That but they're gonna uh, these researchers of Volterra said they're gonna um, take the techniques that they used to decipher the color of this egg, and they're gonna see if they can find some other dinosaur eggs and apply these same techniques to see if uh, they can suss out some some indication of colorization. Cool. Yeah. Speaking of color, what color is the sky? Blue, it, so I'm told. Right, blue today. <laughs> I'd say you're told. Wait, what color is your sky, Blair? I mean, blue. <laughs> you call it blue. I call it blue. <laughs> but, what? That's the thing about color, though. We don't know if I see blue like you see. We know I probably don't, you but I call it blue. probably don't. Right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, anyway. and there has been news over the years, you know, looking at different uh, different cultures from around the world that some have more words for color than others. And historically, blue was not even a word that was used to describe the sky. Blue was a color that showed up much later in our language evolution. So, there's, as a kid, you 
grow up and what color is the sky? What color is that? And somebody tells you, that's blue, kid. And so then you grow up and Blair has her blue. <laughs> we have our blue. <laughs> we call it blue. It's the sky because we have the word blue. So a researcher, Edward Gibson, he's a cognitive scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge. He took a powered light box and a car battery and 80 standardized color chips to the Amazon in order to connect with a group of fairly isolated hunter-gatherers called the Simani. And they live in the jungles of South America. And since they're in such isolation, their language developed in isolation from other groups in the near area. Simane don't have that many words for color, much less than we do or Eng English speakers have. And so according to this study in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, when he went down and asked these Simane individuals to identify the colors on his, uh, from his swatch of 80 color chips, the Simane had a pretty hard time agreeing what to call different colors. Huh. When it came to black, white, and red, the identification was exactly equal with foreign counterparts, Bolivian counterparts and Spanish speaking and English, Amer American English speakers. Can I, can I guess one thing? Huh. They had like 50 words for green. <laughs> right, I don't know that for sure. There's a, there's That's not what. <laughs> yeah, like everything's green. You can't just say, "What's the, what did it look like?" Oh, it was a green, green. area I was in. Green. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Like, like how Eskimos have or uh, Inuits have many, many words for snow. Like yeah. you need that when that's all you're surrounded by. Oh, and uh, related to that, I recently read there it's been confirmed that there are more than two hundred different types of snow. So that. That's useful. There we go. There we go. Anyway, these words for black and white derived from dark and light. So in their language, they came up with the words dark and light, and that's where the words black and white came from. And those are kind of universal concepts that everybody has, and that's, you know, our black and white have also come from dark and light as well. Um, and red is, is really easily identified because... Blood. Blood. Yeah. Blood. Like, Everyone's gonna be like, ah, red blood. Ah, bad. Or, you know, mm, blood. <laughs> sangre. Right. Yum. For a vampire bat. Or for meat. You know. Or for meat. Strawberries. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this kind of uh, where there is a concept that is important to individuals, blood, or light or dark, those concepts begin the communication of color within languages and cultures. That's the idea anyway. And so all three languages, the Samane, the Spanish, and the English described warm colors more easily and better than cool colors. So yellows and oranges had more and better words and the preciseness was better as opposed to blue and green, those colors had fewer words and were less precise. And with their less developed vocabulary, the Simane were still better at describing the warm than the cool colors. And so this concept of things that might be important. So they examined a data set to figure out exactly why that this might be that was collected from Microsoft, about 20,000 photographs. And in the images, cool colored pixels were more likely to be part of a photograph's background, trees in the sky, versus warm colored pixels being related to things that were behaviorally relevant, like clothing or food. And so what they think is that all these words that we use are culturally and behaviorally relevant. And that's how we end up with, we ended up with more words for colors than the Simane. And the hunter-gatherers just really in their daily life, which is very simple, they don't need to describe so many colors. Right, and, and again, a lot of colors uh, are pretty unnatural. Blue is a pretty unnatural color, right? Um, even purple is not something you, you see a lot. And that's, and that's part of perhaps why these were considered at one point noble colors or like, 
kings would dress in purple or blue. Uh, like, they're more rare in nature. And they they're stand rare out. and they're harder to even find something to make them out of, perhaps, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're just not very naturally occurring colors. Yeah. So it, I mean, the sky being blue, again, if the sky is the only blue thing you've seen, you just call it sky. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't need to, you don't need to separate the color from the sky and apply it to other things because nothing else is blue. Yeah. And most yep. bodies of water are not blue. And then the Amazon, it certainly is not blue. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very green, green or brownish yeah. color most of the time. And so basically what they end up, ended up saying, Gibson says, we see the same colors. There's no difference in color perception. We see the same colors as hunter-gatherers but they don't need to label those colors. So it's all about labels. What are names of colors but labels? There we go. Humans like to categorize. We talk yep. about it all the time. Yep. We like categorize put things it. in boxes. That's right. Absolutely. All right. I've got a few more stories. Let's get into some quick science news. This one backwards. I didn't understand it. We talk about uh, sleep deprivation all the time. Chronic sleep deprivation leads to depressive sim symptoms, right? If you don't sleep mm -hmm. enough, your uh, brain stops working well. But if this is a chronic situation, right? What about acute sleep deprivation? There was a meta study published in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry this last week finding that there is a significant effect of acute sleep depression on the treatment of depression. And that 45% uh -huh. to 50% of individuals responded positively to acute sleep deprivation in the huh. studies that were investigated. The studies went back from 1974 to 2016. So you're better off if you don't get <laughs> sleep if you're depressed? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and that it's a very strange thing that in, in at least half of the patients in these studies, they responded positively in to the same level that they would have responded to antidepressants. And the researchers said, we need to look into this a little bit more. We don't understand exactly why this happens. There, so, has, been, there has been work that suggests that this acute sleep depression might release compounds related to the drug sleep ketamine. Depression. Sleep, uh, sleep uh, deprivation. Sleep. Sorry, yeah. sleep deprivation. Yes. One of the one of the symptoms of depression, right, is sleeping a lot, staying in bed, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if it's related to that, if it kind of creates a reset that it makes you're essentially being forced to get out of bed. Right. I also think sort of like our, yeah. our, our conversation about the. Uh, about those who who studied and then drank versus those who didn't that that sleep period is sort of locking in the relevant information of the day mm -hmm. uh, and if you've had a lot of depressive emotions or thoughts throughout the day and you're sleeping a lot you are also allowing those to somehow get mm, locked in cataloged and locked. yeah mm -hmm. and there may be something to just uh ignorance is bliss or at least not dwelling or yeah imprinting i don't know how to say it but that's interesting maybe there, yeah absolutely there's a connection with that with that with that memory imprintation portion of what sleep does that's yeah. that's an effective tool yeah so this is not um, a long-term uh a long-term treatment this is the kind of thing where in their results they found that uh people responded well and benefited for about a, several days to a week and then started Re reporting a relapse of depressive symptoms. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty easy to stay up late on a Saturday night. <laughs> or a Wednesday night. Or a Wednesday night. That's right. Or a Wednesday night to watch This Week in Science. So, so the cure for depression is, <sighs> is perhaps caffeine and right. alcohol used in combination <laughs> uh, for several nice. hours before bed. That, ah, that's how I live. No wonder I'm never down. This is exactly <laughs> how I. <laughs> this is why you're such a positive person, yeah, Justin. Because I'm, I've combined yeah. all the therapeutic effects into one, and I, yeah. I must imprint nothing when I sleep. Yeah. So anyway, so every day is like the first day I've been on the planet too. I can never find my keys. 
Yeah, so there is an effect of sleep deprivation. So we need more study because we really don't know why or how it works. And right. but wow, how interesting. How interesting. Well, it's interesting that, that something weird with sleep is part of the symptoms mm -hmm. and now also has a direct effect yes. on symptoms. Yes. Very interesting. CRISPR news. Researchers are reporting that they're using CRISPR in a genetic removal kind of way that's not involved with human beings, but with butterflies. Mm. Yeah, researchers uh, wanting to find out how this is uh, researchers wanting to find out how moths evolved into butterflies. Mm. Moths, butterflies with their pretty colors came from some group of moths at one point in time, evolved away, uh, be, had got genes that gave them very pretty colors in their wings and became painted ladies and beautiful things that we see during the daytime and identify with daytime activity. What are the genes that are involved? And so these researchers at Cornell University targeted a gene called optics, another one called Wnt A, and some other genes, double sex and cortex. There's a bunch of pattern defining genes they've determined that when they remove them, they affect the way the butterflies look. And they're able to actually reverse paint the butterflies and turn them black. Red, black. yeah, red becomes black, matte nice. becomes shiny when optics is removed. Um, Wnt A removes eye spots, boundaries, and, sh and lines on the wings blur and shift. Uh, researchers at one point they removed a gene from a butterfly, the painted lady butterflies, and they discovered that when you get rid of it, they just go grayscale and look like moths. And the researcher, Reed from uh, C Cornell says, they just turn grayscale. It makes these butterflies look like moths, which is pathetically embarrassing for them. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. But it's, a, it's an interesting way to study the genetic addition and subtraction to determine what genes actually are crucial for the coloration and the identity and the identification, the, the characteristics that identify these different species of moths, uh, of butterflies, and what, what uh, makes them so different from moths. How did evolution act to turn them into the pretty butterflies of today? Thanks, CRISPR, teaching us a moth story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Designer moths coming next. That is right. <laughs> Blair, what else you got? Oh, I have a couple of uh, interesting stories. Uh, all we well, do here is interesting. So yeah. Cool. Um, so back in April, we talked about a study from Spain looking at wax moths breaking down plastic as it passes through their digestive system. And I got really excited because finally, for the first time ever, we found a way to really destroy plastic, not just break it into tinier pieces of plastic. In those results, they showed that wax moth caterpillars intestines chemically biodegrade plastic, mainly by making a mush of squished wax moth caterpillars and then um, they applied it to plastic. They just kind of put this caterpillar mush on the plastic and reported it breaking down into ethylene glycol. However, a recent study from Germany, just last Friday they came out, have reported that, that they have cast doubt on this research. They say it remains unclear whether the caterpillars digest the plastic with their enzymes in their gut or whether they break down the substrate through a process of mechanical milling where they are just making it smaller but not changing it chemically. They looked at the methodology of the Spanish study and they, to see kind of what was happening here, <laughs> they, they took a mixture of egg yolk and ground pork and they swathed that on some plastic and got the same result. And that's definitely not breaking down the plastic into different elements. So, 
The, so what now? The, there's doubt being cast. They say, well, the biodegradation of most inert artificial polymers is definitely a very interesting research field. We must respectfully disagree with the methodology and conclusions from this paper. Snap. Snap. Got to wait for a response now. Yes. The researchers so, need to fight back. Yes. Called out. The tree falls in a forest. Ah! Yes. Stupid autoplay. Oh, no. Autoplay. <sighs> Yeah, it's everywhere now. Do you notice how much autoplay there's in the world now? It's yeah, it's, and, it's like and, and the sound, off. the sound is the worst part. It's one thing if you autoplay, but the autoplay sound. Um, and then the last story that I brought tonight was a little bit of robot domination. Since dun, uh, dun, dun, dun. there is a new skin-like substance. It's a stretchable electronic interface. Ooh. They can serve as an artificial skin, which allows robotic hands to sense the difference between hot and cold. But it also offers as advantages for a wide range of biomedical devices. So the, the main thing here is the ability to tell at touch between hot and cold. But it also has some interesting opportunities where they can actually, with electronic signals, um, the skin can interpret computer signals sent to the hand and reproduce ASL, American Sign Language, signals. So they can take computer signals and make American Sign, which would be a great interpretation. But that also gives the opportunity to go the other way you could interpret American sign into English. So the robotic skin can translate the gesture to readable letters and um, electric impulses to gestures. So robotic hands, hmm. well on the way. To speaking sign language. Uh-huh. And helping and helping. And being able to tell if things are too hot. <gasps> yes. Here, touch this for me. I don't want to touch it myself. <laughs> Forget about having a hot pad. Just use your robotic hand. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, oh, my. All right, Justin. And how you use your robotic hand in the future oh may be informed by this next study. Faculty members of the Indiana University School of Public Health Bloomington and the School Center for Sexual Health Promotion recently published a paper in the Journal of Sex and marital therapy focused on addressing gaps in scientific understanding of women's sexual pleasure. Quote voice of Debbie Herbenick, there had been little known about at the population level about detailed aspects of women's sexual pleasure and orgasm. Most previous studies utilized clinical, college, and convenience samples. We worked to change that with this research and provide data surveying a U.S. nationally representative probability sample of adult women. Uh, Herbenick and her team, research including Brian Dodge, associate professor of the IU School of Public Health Bloomington, conducted the OMG Yes Sexual Pleasure Report. The study findings from the researchers research team's OMG Yes Pleasure Report Women in Touch focused on orgasm and sexual pleasure as related to genital touch and stimulation. The study results challenged the mistaken but common notion that there are universal sex moves that work for everyone, says Dodge. On the other hand, the data also make clear there are certain styles of touch that are more commonly preferred by women, emphasizing the value of studying sexual pleasure, and not just sexual problems. The study found that more than 1,000 women ages 18 to 94 surveyed reported a diverse set of preferences for genital touch, location, pressure, shape, and pattern. Further, 41% of the women preferred just one specific style of touch. Not that they all agreed on the same one, but that they specifically liked just one style themselves. Underscoring the value of couples having conversations about preferences and desires. The study provides the first U.S. nationally representative data on pathways to orgasm during intercourse, noting that nearly 75% of women reported that clitoral stimulation was either necessary for the intercourse orgasms or helped their orgasms feel better, while 18% noted that vaginal penetration alone was sufficient for 
orgasm. So this is a this is actually a pretty fascinating website that I discovered OMG Yes, which I found because of the study, uh, which has it, it is basically a woman's guide to orgasm and then, and not just a guide to it, like how to tips, but it's a conversation about that, uh, that has been, and at times perhaps in the past was a taboo subject or wasn't a subject that anyone talked about. Uh, but it's sort of like an open access sort of participatory. You can give your feedback, you can participate. Um, and it has sort of interesting statistics, uh, up front. Uh, if you go to, if you, let's see, is it under, how, yeah, under how it works, there's research, um, they sort of are, are publishing some of the statistics about different motions and what percentage found that to be a good thing. Um, and there's things that, you know, this is new language, accenting, framing, staging, layering, orbiting, signaling, edging. Uh, these are all... Hint and consistency, surprise, rhythm, multiples. There's a lot of new lingo that if you don't have, then maybe you could add this to your linguistic repertoire, at the very least. OMG, yes. Well, it um, sounds like the, the moral of the story is talk to each other. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but but and but, that, and that but no is, no two women are really going to be the same, and probably no the, two men are going to be the same, and everybody has their personal preferences and right. There's all of that yeah. to it, but also it's giving it's giving a language to have that conversation in, mm -hmm. right? And it's getting specific yeah. language to have that conversation in, which if you didn't have that knowledge of the specific language that you could be having this conversation in, you can't be having this conversation because mm -hmm. you don't have the language with which to have this conversation. Right. It's like, what color is the sky? Talking um, to somebody. Right. I don't have a word for that. Yeah. You can't Absolutely. have the conversation. You can't. Exactly. Yeah. So it's going to give you a lot of words to have that conversation with, apparently. A lot of words. But I think the other good, interesting thing about this study is that uh, that it is a study and it is that this is a research company that's working to try and, I don't know, to answer some questions. And it's asking a lot of questions over a range yeah. of ages. And it's not yeah. like we've we've had this sort of I think we've always colored a lot of our conversations that were sex studies at the college level where it was students who participated like right. and these are like why would we aging. take advice from them yeah <laughs> why, why would we think that that's they don't even know what they want they have no idea <laughs> what's what but i mean like there there is an element of that which there's there's just bias in the age groups that usually yeah. participate in this and the fact that they opened this up from 18 to 91 or 94 what it, what, it, what it was um i think that's important too um yeah, and you can Dig into the research methodology. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. This is this is interesting. It's fun. Thanks for that. And I think that does it. That brings us to the end of another episode of This Week in Science. We have made it through two hours full of science. No interview Ooh. needed. Oh, A couple yeah. of rants here and there, but you know, you know. So at this moment in time, I would like to thank everyone who has stuck with us through this entire show. I would also like to thank everyone who is, who didn't, but who started and was there for a little bit. Yeah, welcome back. Well, yeah. you who gave up, yeah. put us on pause. Yeah, we know you hear us now as you rebooted it later <laughs> on and listened to it. But, uh, yeah. Glad trying. you made it. <laughs> everyone in our chat rooms, thank you so much. Thank you to Fada. Thank you to Identity4. And thank you to Brandon for helping us out all the time. And I would like to thank my our Patreon sponsors. Thank you so much to Paul Disney. Oh, it's restarting, of course. I'm going to have to wait for a second. There we go. 
Paul Disney, G. Burton, Lattimore, John Ratraswamy, Richard Onimus, Byron Lee, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Jacqueline Boyster, Tyrone Fong, Andy Grove, Keith Corsell, Jake Jones, Gerald Sorrells, Chris Clark, Richard Hendricks, Car- Charlene Henry, Brian Hedrick, John Gridley, Steve Bickle, Kevin Railsback, Ulysses Adkins, James Friedel, James Randall, David Friedel, James Randall, Bob Cardle, Mark Masaros, Edward Dyer, Trainer 84, Layla Marshall Clark, Larry Garcia, Randy Mazuka, Tony Steele. Gerald and Yago, Steve DeBell, Louis Smith, The Harden Family, Eifschman, Greg Guthman, Patrick Cohn, Ksenia Volkova, Daryl, Harun Sarang, Alex Wilson, Jason Strideman, James Neighbor, Jason Dozier, Matthew Whitman, Eric Knapp, Jason Roberts, Drift Reporter, Rodney David Wiley, Robert Aston, Sir Frank and Delic, Christopher Rapin, David, I lost it. I was going <laughs> so well. <laughs> I lost it again. And, and while you're resetting, can I ask a question? Yes. Are they in there in no particular order? No particular order. No particular order. They're in there. They are in there. Let's see. How far did I get? Hmm. Go back if you can. Go. Okay. There we uh, are. Paul Stanton, David. There we go. Dana Pearson, Paul Stanton, David Brendan Minish, Dale Bryant, Todd Northcutt, Arlene Moss, Bill Kersey, Ben Rothick, Darwin Hannon, Rudy Garcia, Felix Alvarez, Brian Hone, Orly Radio, Brian Condren, Mark, Nathan Greco, Hexator, Mitch Steves, Flying Out, John Crocker, Christopher Dreyer, R.T. Shuwada, Dave Wilkinson, Steve Mashinsky, Rick Ramos, Gary Swinsburg, Phil Nadeau, Braxton Howard, Saul Good Sam, Matt Sutter, Emma Grenier, Philip Shane, James Dobson, Kurt Larson, Stephen Insama, Honey Moss, Mountain Sloth, Jim Trapeau, Jason Olds, James Paul West, Alec Dodi, Aluma Lama, Joe Wheeler, Dougal Campbell, Craig Porter, Adam Mishkan, Aaron Luthan, Marjorie, David Simmerly, Tyler Harrison, and Columbo Ahmed. Sometimes I make it. Sometimes I don't. Thank you all. Thank you all for supporting us on Patreon. And if anyone out there would like to support us on Patreon, you can find information at patreon.com slash this week in science. Also remember, you can help us out simply by telling your friends to listen to twists. And on next week's show, we will be back once again broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday evening. You can watch, join our chat room. But if you don't make it, don't worry about it because we are on the interwebs in the recorded form. You can find past episodes at twist.org slash YouTube, facebook.com slash This Week in Science, or just twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google... This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have one of those mobile-type devices, you can look up Twist the Number 4 Droid app in the Android Marketplace or simply This Week in Science in anything Apple Marketplace. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org. www.twist.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts. And other listeners. Or you can just contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at this week in science.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at Blair Baz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist T W I S somewhere in the subject line so that your email does not get spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. What? Oh, it's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in 
This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just better understand it. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from Jeopardy. 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 And this week in science is coming away. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science This week in science science, science, science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, science, science. This week in science, this week in 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 science. All right, everybody, this is This Week in Science. This is the end of the show. We are going to keep moving into the after show, which I don't know if it's going to be much of an after show, but we're here for a few more minutes. Justin's not here. He might come back. I don't know. But you know what? I wonder, how does black body radiation affect color? Do you know? Do you know? Mm. See, you're not sleeping tonight. I'm not going to sleep all night. <laughs> I'm going to be learning. <laughs> I'm learning so much. I mean, I knew some things, but I've been figuring things out, and I can figure out some more things. Hmm. I seriously okay. So there was a study that came out uh, of Wikipedia that determined that Wikipedia is actually a scientific source, despite what people say. <laughs> it's a good place to start a fact-finding mission. I I agree with that. Uh, yes. Hold on. Scientific. I'm going to find the. Uh, that's a scientific source. And then there was news. Where's the news? I haven't. This is probably another thing that I shouldn't be. It's probably going to be taken out of context because it was a press release. Um. Okay, the source code of Wikipedia is available for everyone. Okay, great. But this isn't the study. No. Yago, no. I don't care about Yago. That's not the study. TNW, notice that this is not a good source of information. 
Researchers at MIT and the University of Pittsburgh released a paper that shows a direct correlation between information made available on Wikipedia and how likely that work is to be referenced in future scientific literature. Yeah, so basically researchers are using Wikipedia as an, as an initial source also. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a good overview of a topic. Yeah. Although, I mean, looking at this black, it's a great overview of a topic, but sometimes the descriptions of things, oh my goodness. Yeah. They're not, sometimes the descriptions, they're made by experts for experts and or by experts who don't understand that other people don't understand the words they use. But it does send you on a nice little rabbit hole sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. It does kind of, it's one of the great things about Wikipedia that's also kind of terrible is I, I will often go to Wikipedia for one thing and end up with 10 tabs open. Yeah. Because of all the hyperlinked words. I'm like, oh, well, I need to look that. Oh, well, what's, uh, oh, well, I mean, and usually it's like animal stuff I'm looking up for the show. And so I'm like, oh, what, what's the common name for this spider? And then they're like, it's in this family. And as I click that and I'm like, oh, the common name for this family of spiders is this kind of spider. And then it just, it, uh, it's it actually snowballs. The only, what's interesting is that's actually the only time when it's actually appropriate to look up the entomology of a word. Mm hmm. Entomology. <laughs> Why is it that every time I look up the entomology of a word, I get I get all this stuff about bugs? It makes no sense. How does every word <laughs> make a bug? So I want you guys to look at this picture of a lava flow. Whoa, yeah. Which is serious. About eighteen hundred to twenty one hundred degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> it's still going high half <laughs> that is less than half the temperature of this planet. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was that's supposed to be pitch black. I want you to look at the color that you see there. <laughs> not letting it go. You don't need to tell us, Kiki. You need I'm to tell letting letting NASA. Go. <laughs> that's not black. I'm sorry. It's not even dark. There is actually a lot of light emitting as a result of that thermal radiation there. Just Kiki, saying. you better march your butt over to uh, Florida. That's where they are, right? Hot Rod, shh, hush. <laughs> That's right. I gotta go to Florida. Go to Florida. Oh my goodness. Go tell them what's what. Oh my God. If you guys, my cat is, my door is barely open and the cat is poking her paw through the door. <gasps> I love that. She's like, I'm gonna open the door, but I'm not really. Just this little tiny bit of a paw. It's kind of like, just on the edge of the screen. Oh, oh, she got the door open. Hi. Hi, Stella. What you doing? Time to say hi, huh? Hi. She said, I heard the music. That means I can come out. Yeah. Hi. Stella. Yeah, just Stella. Cute. Mm hmm. It was really fun, though, this morning, having a conversation, finding this story about this planet enabled me to have a conversation about why the sky is blue with my son. Mm. It awesome. It was so funny, though. I was like, do you know why the sky is blue? And he looks at me and he goes, yes. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> oh, you don't want to get down, do you? Because he told me, it's the sky. Because it's the sky, mommy. No, he says... He said that he goes, I know. He says, he says, the sun has all the colors, sunlight has all the colors of the rainbow in it. And then it comes and it hits our planet. But we have where there's we have an atmosphere. He says we there's there's things, mal, there's particles. I don't remember exactly. I think he said particles. There's particles in the atmosphere. And there are lots of them. The light, it bounces around. The light bounces around. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Pretty, pretty much, much. yeah. Pretty much got it there. Good job, kiddo. I'm like, where'd you learn that? He's like, I don't know. TV. I just know things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Raleigh, the Rayleigh, Raleigh, Rayleigh scattering. Rayleigh, the researcher, is also very important in the uh, the discovery or the explanation of black body radiation as well. 
Just to continue along that line of conversation. Black body radiation. My whole childhood, adults kept telling me that the sky is blue because the oceans. Because, <laughs> like, the color of the oceans are reflected into the sky. Yeah, that's wrong. Yeah, and then I would I got older and I was like, oh, hold the phone, hold the phone. I believed you. Number one, the ocean's not blue. <laughs> it's basically green. So no. And number two, what about on land? <laughs> It's like, know. there's all sorts of holes in this. There's many holes on I it. Why is the sky it. blue if I'm in the middle of Nebraska looking at Carvenge? Yeah. Car okay. Henge. Okay. Give me any any two-digit number, and I will times it by 11. Any two-digit number? Yeah. 72. 72. I'm going to say 792. Give me another one. Oh, that's neat. I've never realized that. Right. Yeah. That's a cool pattern. Isn't it? So, uh, oh, how it adds together. Interesting. 81 would be 891. Is that right? That's it. That's right. That, so, but how would something... you do, how would you do like do it, do 84? Hit me with it. 84. 84 is perfect. That is. is that would be 12. They got a 12. 924? 924. 924. Yeah. 924. That's really cool. Add them up. Isn't that cool? That's a cool trick. I never knew about that. Mm -hmm. So you take the you take the two numbers. So it's uh say say, say seventy one, and you split them. You put the seven on one side and one to the other, and you add them together. Seven and one. You put the eight in the middle. Seven eighty one. That's eleven times seventy one. That's now, really cool. You get into the remaindery problem, like we did with the uh, what was it? Eighty uh, four. And you take eight to the side, you put four to the side, and you add them together, and you get 12. So you put the two in the middle, and you add the one to the eight, the remainder over to the thing, nine, and eight, and you get 924. And you can actually do this with a three digit number as well. <gasps> what? Yeah, let's take something simple 111 times 11. Well, you got your ones on the outside, but then you take that one in the middle and you add it to, together. You take those, the, the middle and the outside and any middle and the other inside and you get one, two, two, one. That's how you do that. And you can even follow that remainder too and push it over. Like it's, is that a remainder or a, a whatever it is? You know what you're teaching right now, Justin? Math. New math. New math. New math. Yeah. When, New I, math. when I was in elementary school, I was around for the like three years that they tried to teach exclusively mm. new math. And suddenly the sub the subject that was my favorite, I hated. Oh, oh no. Yes, because my brain doesn't do that as well. My it's brain, a, yeah. so a lot of people that historically don't like math respond really well to new math. But some people mm. that get math inherently have issues with new math. Yeah, I don't have. I'm having an issue with these tricks. <laughs> exactly. Like, so, so if, but I can actually see the multiplication problem in my head, and I can multiply it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. 123 times 11. I'm gonna put down a three. I'm gonna add the two and a three, and I'm gonna get a five. I'm gonna add the one and the two. I'm gonna get a three, and I'll put the one to the other end. I get one three five three. See, and I would rather do 122 times 10 plus 122, and that my brain right. would do much faster. Yeah, yeah, that was just a cool pattern that I yeah found, no I didn't find I uh, like we were it's a we fun were, pattern uh, we were playing with with yeah. we were playing, it was with my daughter watching math videos today this awesome was, that's cool yeah. that's fun yeah it just it goes to Yay. show you that like it the way to teach there's no one right way to teach a thing no yeah. that's Whatever. the problem I mean it's like. It's like having, you know, learning PowerPoint. You know, there are so many different ways to get to the same solution. Yeah. In the end, you still have a pretty picture. Yes.
Are you a are you a like a right click sort of person or a menu based person or like a toolbox based person? There's like six different ways to do anything. Right. Yeah. What Stella? What do you want? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm finally yes, seeing your more email. Than one way to get a cat. No, what email? What email? What did I do? You said Twist needs to do this. Oh, yeah. I thought it was fun. There was an, uh, Justin, you might, I don't know if you saw the video. There was, uh, a, it's an old, it's an old video from like several years back, but it would be a fun, it's like, uh, a trivia or choose your own adventure type uh, type thing where you start the video and then you can ask a, a trivia question and then have different links to different answers, like true or false oh or God. whatever different answers are on the sides and people click on them and then they go to whatever the response is. And so then we have to make two videos, one for, oh, you got it right, blah, 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 blah. And then the next question, or, oh, where, where you okay. got it wrong. Do you know why this isn't a question. thing? What? Because after asking a series of 10 questions, <laughs> you've created a- Like 100 videos. <laughs> no. <laughs> I know. That's yes. why it's not a thing. <laughs> You're like, we're not doing this. <laughs> no, no. I'm all for it. I'm just saying. You're only, there's a reason you don't see a lot of this. That's right. <laughs> yes. But we could be the ones that put in the yeoman's effort of endless, endless nuanced responses to every right, wrong question through the tree. Right. Absolutely. Right. Totally do that. Could be the ones. We could make a science choose your own adventure or a uh, an audio book choose your adventure. You know, it would be read, a funny read, form of storytelling. Story. Yeah. And, and story if you're telling, familiar at all with a real choose your own adventure book, you do you do immediately recognize that you can recycle a ton of material because you can you have one trajectory sometimes lead back to the you know a couple different trajectories mm -hmm. early on can lead back to the same place that they then go forward from mm -hmm. therefore saving thickness of pages need that need to be written so i used to love choose your own adventure books i know those were the best so wow. i had this compulsive desire to read the whole book and so it was really hard for me to get through a choose your own adventure book because I would like make my decision and read it and get to the end where they'd make you make your next decision. And I'd be like, I got to go back and see what the other one was. <laughs> <laughs> I did the same thing. I actually yeah. like, I would rip up pieces of paper and use them as placeholders. Yes. Yes. So that I could go back and decide, oh, I don't like that ending. I need to go back. Yeah. I'm going to go back again. I loved it because I could do whatever I wanted. I'm like, this book is mine. I can read any possible trajectory that I want, and I'm not going to die. I refuse to die. <laughs> <laughs> the one that I read a bunch when I was a kid, uh, it was, I wonder if it came before Honey, I Shrunk the Kids or if it was a cheap knockoff after, but it, you shrank and you were in the yard. And there was like a cat and there were bugs and you had to like build a, a shelter out of grass. And <laughs> I, I very clearly remember like coming across the cat in the choose your own adventure. And I, I, yeah, I wonder now as an adult, I'm like, was that, was that like really old, like from the seventies and it was pre honey, I shrunk the kids. Possibly. Sounds like something Google could tell me about. Yeah. Oh, there's like all kinds of online choose your own adventure stories, but you have to read them. Ugh. You have to read them. Oh my goodness. So hard. Help, you're shrinking. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all needed. Yeah. 
All right, I'm tired tonight. Quiet, tired. <laughs> oh, I'm pretty tired. No, the choose your own Trump biography that Strengths oh. came up with. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's actually more of a more like I'm, how it. I'm just busy watching the train crash that's happening in real life. Oh, Shrunken right. Doctor uh, Who's night. awesome. Yeah, let's go to sleep. Let's go do that. Let's get our, I think okay. we've been awake. This is enough acute sleep deprivation, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm going to have a lot tomorrow. <laughs> good night. Good night. Uh, minions. Isn't good night, everybody. It, is it, night? it is night. Say good night, Blair. Hi, Blair. Say good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. Good night, Kiki. Good night, good Kiki. Night. And everyone, I hope you enjoy the fall equinox, that you enjoy the turning of the season. It's already happened here in Portland. The fall has come. And we will see you in the fall. Have a nice trip. See you, everyone. Come back next week. Thanks so much for being here. <laughs>